Welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy and the book that I will be reading the first chapter from today is called Those Kids from Fawn Creek and this is by Erin Entrada Kelly. This is the story of a group of kids who live in a small town in Louisiana called Fawn Creek. There have only ever been 12 kids in their class at school so they all know these 12. They've all grown up together they know the mean people, they know the girls who go to church, they know the nerds, and everything always stays the same as it has been. The book starts off from the point of view of Grayson. He's one of the seventh graders at Fawn Creek that we're hearing from. We do get multiple chapters from other points of view throughout the book, really from a lot of the voices in this class at Fawn Creek, which is also the name of the school. So 12 kids every year, they all know each other, small town, and at the start of this book, there is a 13th classmate who arrives. Her name is Orchid, and she has been all over the world, and she's interesting, and she's different, and some people really want to get to know her. Some people are immensely jealous of her. She really changes and disrupts the dynamic of the class, some ways good, some ways bad. And as the book goes on, you start to realize how sometimes when you're stuck in your ways, changes and a new viewpoint and a different way to look at yourself and to look at other people can actually be beneficial. So I don't want to tell you much about certain disruptions and certain good or bad changes because I think that you should read the book to find out. There's a lot of great storylines in it. I will now read the first chapter. It's in the first section of the book, which starts off with the title Week One. One. On the day Orchid Mason walked through the door of Fawn Creek K through 12, Grayson Broussard's right shoulder ached. A bruise would form there. He could tell. Stupid Trevor. Trevor had said he was just kidding around when he pinched and twisted Grayson's skin. But what kind of kidding is it when one person is laughing and the other wants to crawl into a hole and die? And he'd done it on the way to school in the truck with their dad right there, not saying or doing anything as usual. All because Grayson said he didn't want to go duck hunting. People start to think you're soft the way you go around, his father had said, his meaty hand propped on the steering wheel as the truck pulled into the drop-off line. Last I checked, I have two sons, not a son, and a daughter. That's when Trevor howled with laughter, even though it was an old joke, one their father had told many times before. He's already soft, Trevor said, and that's when he pinched him. Weren't older brothers supposed to be role models or something? When the truck pulled into the circle, Grayson got out and lingered behind like usual, watching his stupid brother take the front steps two at a time. It was Friday, November 1st, and Grayson was going to school just like he'd done every week since the beginning of time, to see the same 11 classmates he'd known since the dawn of man, because in Fawn Creek, the air was hot and humid, the mosquitoes nipped your arms, and nothing ever changed. At that moment, Grayson decided to let his mind float away from school to the nearby creek. He imagined he was standing toe to water with a fishing rod in his hand. The creek is quiet and there's no one around but me, the water, and the fish. No father, no brother, no school, just me. He would have floated through the entirety of the morning if Dorothy hadn't kicked his chair and jolted him back to reality at the beginning of first period English. She did it lightly. Dorothy did everything lightly. But it was enough. That's when he looked up. The pain faded as soon as he saw her. Not really, of course, but it seemed like it. The pinch disappeared. The hurt evaporated. Mr. Augusto tapped his desk with his knuckles, even though everyone was already looking at him. Or more accurately, looking at the girl standing by his side. Attention all, Mr. Augusto said, his eyes shining. We have a new student. It was obvious that Mr. Augusto was trying not to show his excitement. He made the same face when he introduced projects that he thought the students would be into, like writing imaginary letters to dead poets that none of them cared about. Dear Emily Dickinson, is it true that you wore a white dress and never left your house? Or is that made up? Grayson's letter had said, even though Grayson didn't care much about Emily Dickinson's poetry, he'd been fascinated by the poet herself. She seemed so mysterious. 
And now he was fascinated by a new mystery, this girl standing at the head of the class in a white t-shirt and breezy pleated skirt. Grayson's mother was a seamstress. She fixed hems, made decorative pillows, took in pageant and prom dresses, and he knew a pleated skirt when he saw one. The girl's hair was long, very long, past her waist and wavy. No, not wavy, curly, big, disheveled, but somehow looking like it was supposed to be that way. There was a white flower tucked behind her ear, even though it was November and no one was thinking about flowers. And who tucked flowers behind their ears anyway? Usually, the 12 seventh graders were careful to leave their faces blank and expressionless. No one wanted to be the first to admit they were excited about anything. But this, a real life new student, a real life new anything, was far more interesting than any science experiment. People from somewhere else just didn't come to Fawn Creek, certainly not unannounced. The next closest thing was Mr. Augusto, who was born in Venezuela and was the only non-white face in almost every room. But he had moved to Fawn Creek when he was three years old because his dad got a job at Gimmerton. And like Grayson, Dorothy, and virtually everyone else, he had never traveled outside of South Louisiana since then. The farthest he'd gone was Baton Rouge to go to Louisiana State, and that was just two hours away. Small towns are like magnets, Grayson's mother once said. They pull you in and don't let go. And now the magnet had lured in a stranger. Janie and Abby Crawford sat up straight and fixed their blue eyes on her. Grayson wondered what they were thinking. Max Bordelon, Daniel Landry, and Michael Colt, all of whom played youth football together in the next town, exchanged looks and smirks. Barnett and Lehigh Kingery slouched at their desks. The others shifted in their seats. Grayson watched as the girl waved hello, like a royal greeting her subjects. The bangles on her wrist jangled. She smiled, a big, natural, easy smile that showed all her perfectly straight teeth. Dalen Gidry and Bailey Trahan, who sat in the row next to him, pursed their lips. They'd both recently gotten braces. Hallie Romero, the third girl in their trio, had spent days trying to convince them they looked great. Mr. Augusto continued, her name is... I'm Orchid Mason, the girl said. She pointed to the only empty desk in the classroom. It was right next to Janie and Abby Crawford. I'll just sit there if that's okay. She breezed to her new desk and sat down in one fluid movement. She smelled like citrus. And just like that, there were 13 of them. That is the end of the first chapter of those kids from Fawn Creek. And though there are these 12 kids in the class, the book does feature Grayson pretty heavily and Dorothy. They are the ones who immediately get to know Orchid. So there's really this trio right in the beginning, Grayson, Dorothy, and Orchid. But then in such a small town, eventually everybody gets to know everything that's going on and everybody has some interaction with everybody else. That's where the book gets really interesting and exciting. It's a really good story about people sometimes maybe being scared to make any changes or to tell people how they really feel or to express what is inside themselves in a small town because they have to maintain the status quo. Everything has always been the way it is. And as you can see, Grayson has a father who thinks a certain way about gender. It's a town that's mostly all white. Those factors can create restrictions around how people live their daily lives. I have read a couple other books by Aaron and Trada Kelly, and they were excellent. This one was also excellent. I plan to dive into the rest of her books. I'm going to read everything she's written. If you haven't read anything by her, I recommend it. And Those Kids from Fawn Creek is a great place to start. Thanks for joining me.